Hey, good evening, and welcome to episode five of our Boss Talk series. Uh, Battalion Chief Davis here, happy to uh, lead you into tonight's presentation again. Uh, as we've done in the past, if you are a certified chief officer and you wish to receive COPDI credit, uh, please make sure that you log in with your name and your fire service ID. And then, of course, when we are done, episodes over, you need to do the same thing, logging off uh, with that same information. And then uh, Battalion Chief Thomas will take care of the COPD hours. Questions, uh, should you have questions, as we've done before on our YouTube Live, uh, just type them in. I'll be handling that moderator role tonight, so I will try to work those into the presentation uh, as best we can into that uh, discussion point as we move forward. Some other things. Uh, so tonight we wanted to try uh, something a little different on the Boss Talk episodes. So as you know, COLA has gone on a couple times over the last few years. And for those of you who've been around for a while, you would have remembered our officer candidate schools uh, of which myself was involved in. And then most recently, some of the COLA stuff Captain Miller was involved in. And after some of our uh, discussion with Chief Bailey and Chief Kerrigan and some other folks, we thought that it would be interesting to try to uh, share at least some of the principles that, uh, from the COLA program in terms of, we'll see, on-scene operations. So tonight is kind of an experiment. I think that uh, you'll probably enjoy it. You can play along at home as you want. Uh, we have three candidates from the field. We sent out a request. Uh, about two months ago, six weeks ago, hey, who would like to come and give this a shot? So we appreciate them for stepping up and being willing to, to talk through this. <clears throat> so again, the boss talk is geared to our company officers. It is good for everybody, right? But geared to our company officers, what are they thinking about uh, when we're talking about incident response, everything from a service call to being a first engine on the third alarm, right? What kind of things are you thinking about? And we try to uh, replicate, hey, we're sitting around the kitchen table at the firehouse talking about the incidents. Of course, COVID, no kitchen table, but you get the idea. So tonight, uh, we're titled uh, First In Company Level Operations, the COA Experience, and that's going to be led by Captain Brady Miller. And I'm going to turn that over to him now. You won't see me again, so remember to do what we talked about in terms of getting credit <clears throat> for any COPDI. Captain Miller. Chief, thank you. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all back to the training school. Um, before we begin, I'm going to introduce our panel that we have here tonight. To my immediate left, Lieutenant Braun, uh, Battalion 3 on the C shift, correct? Or Battalion 5 on the C shift, I'm sorry. Uh, Lieutenant Shipley. Battalion 1 on the A shift, and uh, Lieutenant Purcell, a BCC day work lieutenant. Uh, so we all have done this around the firehouse for years. Um, I'm going to kind of reiterate what Chief Davis says. This is really just a breakfast table, a lunch table discussion. We're going to throw a picture up. I want to hear what you guys have to say about the picture, and then we'll kind of see where that spins from there. Um, but before we start, take 30 seconds and tell us a little bit of background, if you will. Sure. Uh, so I know I kind of joked a little bit in my bio. Uh, majority of my career I spent in the 1st Battalion. I've got about 14 years now on the job. Uh, just recently promoted to lieutenant about a year and a half ago. Prior to that, I was a master for a short period of time at Company 25. And uh, prior to that, I spent my time in the Marine Corps for about eight years. Okay. Lieutenant Shipley? Uh, on the job for tw 12 years. I've been a lieutenant for the past three. Um, prior to promotion, I was a master medic at 12 on the A shift. Uh, prior to that, firefighter uh, company 16 on the C shift. Lieutenant Purcell, you. Been in the department as a whole for about 12 years. Uh, before <clears throat> I was at Rockville for a few years, Sandy Spring before that. Um, left BCC for a little bit, came back. Um, been running the day crew there where I manage roughly 
29 uh, day workers between full-time and part-time, and that is all that I do right now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Lieutenant Shipley, we're going to start with you. Gotcha. All right. So just to kind of set a stage, we're going to say this is uh, Company 35's area. Okay. It was a day just like today. Uh, you know, we've done a lot of shift change fires here recently, so we'll say it's a shift change. Cool. Uh, so in the 7 o'clock-ish hour, um, you have been there long enough to set your stuff up, not really provide any direction if that's what you do to the, the, the people in the fire truck. And uh, let's see picture uh, number 20. So you are pulling into a complex. So this is the road that leads you into the <coughs> complex. You look to your left, and this is what you see. Okay. Um, we'll kind of go from there. So you said it's... So you are the first engine. I am sorry. Okay. So as the uh, first engine on the assignment, uh, obviously looking at the MDC, checking for reports, um, discussing the information that's provided to the crews in the back, um, Water supply, very key. Looking at the map, confirming that, working with the driver to ensure that the driver's aware of where, where we're going, <clears throat> what we're doing. Coming down the street, got a uh, pretty decent column. So this is a Charlie side of view, correct? Back, yes. Back patio, deck area. Um, so pulling up, give the one scene report. Um, and then you said it's first thing in the morning. I probably haven't had the opportunity to address with my crew the expectations of the day, what lines, you know, we're going to be pulling what, you know, who's responsible for what. Uh, so going down the road would be beneficial to um, do that prior to, uh, prior to getting there. Got a pretty decent volume of uh, fire on the rear deck, Charlie's side, good smoke um, up in the Soffit area. So getting a line on it quickly to, you know, control the horizontal and vertical spread of the fire would be my uh, priorities. So can I ask, um, and I'm not, <clears throat> I just kind of want to pause for a second. So, so you said uh, w when you look over to the left and you see this, I'm going to talk to the people in the back of you, whether you're updating with NBC updates or what, what kind of things are you talking about? Hey, you know, we're dealing with, uh, first off, based on the construction. So this is the middle of the road townhouse, yeah, right? Yeah, wood frame. Uh, middle of the road townhouse. Um, my biggest concern, seven o'clock in the morning, occupant status, right? Is there a life safety issue? You know, um, a lot of, with the environment and things, how or how things are these days. People are working from home. Kids may or may not be in school. So taking all those things into consideration, I can't see the driveway in the front to see if there's cars there. I can't see if there's occupants from the front. Um, <clears throat> so Taking all those things in consideration, we're dealing with a lightweight wood frame structure. Fire spread is going to happen horizontally, vertically. Uh, looks like vinyl siding on the rear there, unburned fuel. So getting quick water on this, getting an occupant status, and then getting searches done um, to, to hold that in check would be my primary. So is your idea of quick water, and we don't know. what These, these sure. are hard to do a lot of times, sure. two-dimensional pictures, right? So is your idea of the quick water through or around the back? So if, if I can, um, if I have great access there, I wouldn't stop short as long as I can have a water supply, and then we'll, we'll get it from there. And the, my logic and reasoning behind that is if we pull up out front, I'm going to have to go around, which is, could take considerable amount of time, um, and not being able to see the front of the building kind of makes it a little bit different. Certainly. Um, <clears throat> but trying to stretch the line to where it needs to go to get the water on it, the base or the seat of the fire the fastest, um, you know, trying to stretch around that row of townhouses might not be beneficial. I could go through an exposure. Um, you know, if the door is unlocked to the exposure building, we could easily go through the exposure and start knocking it. Uh, but if I have a capable water supply, I'm going to just position the apparatus and 
you know, let the units know, hey, I'm parking on site Charlie and initiating my operations from there. So what if I were to tell you there's no Charlie access here? Sure. So no Charlie access, like there's a from from this vantage point? Yeah, we're looking across the field, maybe a retention pond or, you know, we're okay, pulling sure. into the complex. So we'll, so we'll go we'll go into the complex, you know, pick up the hydrant there, uh, have the driver pull past to ensure that we can leave adequate room for the aerial apparatus. Uh, I'm going to have the crew deploy a cross lay. Uh, through the, um, it all depends. It all depends, you know, depends on the conditions that we have inside. You know, do I have occupants? Um, you could stretch inside, start your operations on the first floor, go out and mop up the, or start knocking down the deck, seeing if there's an, any interior extension. Uh, or you could go through, the, you know, an exposure if you have that. I would probably just go into the, uh, the fire building. First floor, you know, and um, depending if the windows or if that rear slider has gave way, I'm going to have some exposure or some exposure. Taking into consideration any occupants that might be in yeah. there? Yeah, and, um, you know, given that time of the day, it could be upstairs in the bedrooms. So getting positioned, getting a line in place, getting that occupant status. If I don't have any reports of that, I have to engage with that information, stretch the attack line in, into the first floor so in this being in 35's area do you does that yeah I change mean, any of the building features that you take into consideration so 35's area is newer um you're going to be which dealing, means what to you're you going to be dealing with sprinklers um so if there was any potential extension inside um as long as the fire didn't over overtake that sprinkler system uh we should at least have possibly some kind of suppression going on inside by the sprinkler 25 gallons a minute, whatever it is. Um, obviously, we discussed about the lightweight wood frame stuff. Um, the bulk of the fire is on that deck, but I do have some fire running the eaves up there. So very quickly while we're trying to get the fire knocked down, get our searches completed, would be getting companies up on that second floor to, to check for any vertical extension or any direction to incoming units. What if you go in there and it's very light smoke inside? Light smoke? Does that, does that change any of your direction to any other units? No, I wouldn't say so. Um, my, my priorities still remain the same, that life safety and then stabilizing that incident by getting the, the fire knocked down uh, and then assigning companies based on um, what I'm seeing, right? I'm going to take my line to the first floor, knock down anything that's inside, work our way out, get the bulk of the fire knocked down. If the deck is stable, start sweeping those eaves with the, with the attack line. Uh, when the trucker squad shows up, have them start that primary search function uh, and then get the uh, second due engine to the most threatened exposure. Lieutenant Braun, would, would you do anything different? So or add to, to what Lieutenant Ship? I think the tactic is sound. Um, I think the biggest thing is there's a deviation there. Um, so, uh, you Meaning know, we're going to, well, if we're coming at it from the Charlie side, then, then we need to let the other units know. And we can do that. Our IRP allows us to go off script as much as we want, as long as we hit those three uh, deliberate, defendable, and communicated. Um, so, and uh, Lieutenant Shipley kind of hit all the, and it really depends on, on, I don't want to. I don't want to take a cop out and say I need to see more of the. No, it picture. is a two-dimensional, and it's hard to do, right? So, I like just because we're going to move some things around. If I come at it from the Charlie side, whereas going straight through the townhome, um, number one, that's that's pretty standard as far as our IRP goes. Number two. Gives me a view inside, uh, allows other allows the truck company to conduct a search, stay on the hose line, um, allows me to see inside of the townhome. Um, the other thing is, is I can take my line straight through that townhome, right out the back door, um, knock that fire from the backside, and that way I'm not deviating too much. But I mean, it kind of depends on how I'm pulling into the structure and my direction of travel, where my hydrant is. Um, so I think the tactics sound. Um, as long as the incoming units know that, hey, 
I'm taking this first line to the Charlie side, and uh, you're going to have to kind of adjust off of that. So someone else is going to have to pick up responsibility. So are you saying you would go to the Charlie side? Uh, well, well, it depends on. So if I told you the occupant status was known, everybody that lives in this townhouse is out of the structure, does that change any? Yeah, it does. Yeah, yeah. So I think with this, the biggest threat is fast wall, or excuse me, the biggest threat is the spread of the fire inside the townhome and then inside the exposures as well. So the quicker we get this fire knocked, the better off we'll be. So the faster I'm able to get a line of that fire, the better off the entire incident will be. So I think supporting the incident, incident objectives, getting a line of this fire quickly, I think that's probably the most sound tactic, given the occupant status is known. What about in those exposures? Well, the exposures, I mean, they got to be searched, too. we got to know what's going on in those exposures, especially. So a lot of tasks down, right, right yeah. away. Yep, yep. But our primary task is. Yeah, yeah. So the, it's, I mean, it's, it's fast water. It's, it's, it's knocking that fire. Um, <sighs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's okay. No, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's like I said, I, I don't want to cop out and say, you know, I got to see more of the map. I got to see the picture. But, I mean, I kind of do just to – and, and I'm not going to – I don't want to say it's going to be a split-second decision, but ultimately it's going to determine whether or not I'm going to adjust the balance of that box assignment off of me or whether or not I'm just going to run a line right through that house and, and knock that deck and knock that siding down. What are some guidance this, that – and Lieutenant Shipley, we'll go back to you. When you were talking – you said – I'm going to tell the guys in the sure. the firefighters in the back. What are some things that you discuss when you go into a a firehouse for the first time, or you're detailed somewhere? Sure. So as a float, yeah, you know, I I've, I don't have an assigned firehouse, so we're uh, every day, you know, flip flopping around. Over time, you develop a rapport. You get to uh, recognize, you know, what the different shifts do. And I'm not going in there in the morning trying to. I'm not going in there in the morning trying to rewrite the script, rewrite the playbook, right? So if they're good with doing long lines and building them out, that's what we're going to do. If they have a particular tactic that they utilize for these kind of events, I'm not, you know, I'm not there to change their game plan, right? So have that discussion in the morning. You know, what do you guys normally do? Do you build out lines? Do you do long lines? Do you do leader lines? Um, you know, is there a certain responsibility, right? Does the, is the medic always the backup person? Does, you know, who pulls the line? You know, does the driver grab a rack? Does the officer grab a rack if you're building out? So just having that discussion um, makes it, makes going to an, an incident like that run that much smoother. Certainly, certainly. Hey, Chief Davis wants to ask a question. Okay. So I, I was thinking about this for a minute. So uh, you could work this in. How are, what would you do different, or what would you, how would you handle it if you arrived engine only, and then say two engines and a truck together, right? Because our deployment is different, right? So you could easily in the up county area arrive with an engine only, and like hmm, nobody else is here. And in other areas, right, the down county area, two engines that are special show up pretty fast, right? Sure. So that might be different. I think uh, folks would be interested in hearing what you might do differently if you arrived single piece by yourself as opposed to, hey, I see, I see two others coming. They're, they're pulling up right now with me, right? So I think at the end of the day, the objectives are still the same, right? We have a lot of tasks that need to be accomplished however we only have a limited number of personnel readily available um, getting that occupant status would be the number one thing once arriving on scene given the time of the day given the conditions and everything that we're we're dealing with and still fast water on that fire would mitigate a lot of the issues right putting the water where it needs to go to knock it down putting it on the deck, putting it on the siding, sweeping those eaves, getting the water where it needs to go will help keep that fire in check until additional units arrive so that we can get um, searches completed, so that we can get um, extension checked both, both horizontally and vertically. So util utilizing your water that you have effectively to, to do that. People are always going to be our number one concern. Absolutely. Right? If the fire goes out, it's super nice for us and super nice for them. Sure. But our 
concern is people. So um, let's move to, uh, yes. Hot in off the press. Uh, someone would like to know uh, a question of Lieutenant Purcell. What would your actions be if you arrived uh, on the special service, meaning the rescue squad, and there is nobody else there yet? So we're going to, and, and we're not. That's okay. We're not going to uh, evade that question, but I actually, you were going to do the next scenario. So with that in mind, mm -hmm. um, the next scenario. So we're going to do number um, five. If you would put picture five up. Uh, it is in the middle of the afternoon today. Middle of, so weather like today, your middle of the afternoon. You arrive uh, first mm -hmm. on a ladder truck. All right. So we have a, what looks like a three-story garden apartment. I'm guessing I can't see the whole photo. We have people out on the balconies. You have smoke showing. I mean, we're not stretching any lines, obviously. We can do the next most important thing is ladders up. I mean, you can throw ladders at balconies. You'll be picking people off. Um, you know, try to shut any doors to contain that, contain that smoke. If you have any interior doors in the stairwell to make that stairwell, stairwell more tenable for folks that are below that fire. Um, that's, that would really be my game plan. You know, I wouldn't try to beat a dead horse. Yeah. So I think that was great that you brought that up actually. And if we go back to the picture, uh, where the majority of that smoke is coming from where, you know, the stairwell, mm -hmm. right? We don't know if it's above or below. Yeah. But so judging by this building, that's, that's going to be those occupants main exit. Yeah. If we can make that more tenable for them to self evacuate. The Certainly better. easier to facilitate yep. moving them through that stairwell. Right. Yep. Either you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think with that, I think obviously our, our number one priority is always going to be life safety. So we arrive on the special, uh, the quicker we get ladders up, the quicker we at least begin to uh, to VES. So our, our threat is that common access, right? And that common access is compromised. So most of our occupants are going to be coming down through the balcony. So the sooner we get ladders up and we give them a chance to uh, escape off that balcony, the better off we'll be. I mean, there's really not much else we can do as far as a special service, we can go in and we can try to search from the inside, but I think we're just setting ourselves up for failure, whereas with that VES tactic all day. What about the, uh, we didn't really talk about the backside potentially of this building, right? Sure, and the fire location within that building. Uh, you, you start moving yourself through that egress pathway, a window breaks in the rear, uh, you change the change of flow path, change how the uh, the air is moving through there, and you could have a really bad uh, outcome. But and then again, I think one of the keys here, and I don't know that I thought about it before looking at this, was controlling that door. Absolutely. If we can get to that apartment and control that door, that might be best for everybody. Um, so certainly a, a concern. Um, I got a question. Yes, sir. Let's go back to the around back, right? So, uh, I'll ask Lieutenant uh, Purcell. Uh, would you go around back? It's kind of a leading question. You'll see where I'm going, right? Go around back. What? Would you go around back to take a look if you could? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, especially on the townhouse fire. Uh huh. I mean. If you can't see all three levels of that townhouse, I mean, you know, obviously life safety is our thing, obviously, for the civilians and us. Um, you know, getting getting eyes on all three floors of that is, is paramount in my in my view. Um, I was on a collapse in uh, 29's area where the basement was off, but reading the report, it was obstructed by the fence. So they didn't get a clear view. Um, I'm, I'm big on circle checks. My guys know that's what I do when I arrive on scene. I put my eyes on all four sides of the building, do it whether I'm on the initial squad or I'm on the RID. I do it every time, and that just helps me get a, a better layout of the house and gives me eyes where 
these guys would be operating if I'm on the road. So a follow up to that real quick. What happens if you run? So you you run around back by yourself just to take a quick look and you get back there and opposite of that balcony, meaning on the back side of that balcony, there's like three people on that balcony who are in more dire need than that lady out front. So, I mean, I would just call to my guys and you ladders out back on side Charlie. Yeah. And so it's almost a double edged yeah. sword, right? Yep. I mean, it's, it's, you could very easily be pulled out there and now, now you're stuck out there. These people yeah. are you're limited by your people. Certainly. So I, you got, you know, Montgomery County, unless you're running out of eight, you got three people in that truck company or that special. So you've got yourself, your driver, and then your, your extra person. So, I mean, you can split it up and you can run around back and then you can radio and have somebody hopefully bring a ladder around back to assist you. But I mean, at the end of the day, until you get more resources on the scene, there's only so much you can do. So just start at the, those that are uh, in most, uh, most threatened and work your way out from there. Yeah. So I want to keep going with this. Just give me another minute or so. So I got jammed up on that myself. I'm always interested in this photo, right? Because so as the chief, I thought, oh, let me just run around back. I'll get a quick look before everybody else gets here. And there are people on the balcony no. who see me as the fire department. And mm -hmm. a lady is like trying to hand me her kid, right? Problem is I'm by myself. So I, I would encourage everybody to think about that. We all talk about, hey, run and do a circle check. What happens if you find something really bad in the back and you're by yourself, right? I would like one other part, and then I'll shut up on this. Uh, you put the picture back up, please, the photo. What are you doing with the people that are already doing stuff with that ladder? How about it? I agree. I agree. So... You got you got rescues to be made, especially if there's people in a, in a more dire circumstance. Absolutely, I mean if they're if they're coming down that ladder and it looks like they're they're making it okay. I mean we'll keep eyes on them and we'll make sure that you know that ladder is maybe the driver just real quick peek, just make sure hey this thing isn't about to collapse. But yeah, at that point we're limited by our personnel, so the more help we get, the better. Yeah. And I and again I would I, I tend to agree with Chief Davis that getting sucked into the rear of the place and now you're by yourself. There's only two people out front, you know. Um. So, Lieutenant Braun, are mm -hmm. you ready? All right, let's go. So we are going to go to picture number two, <clears throat> and uh, it's ten o'clock at night. Uh, your engine number two. Okay. On this picture. It's kind of hard to make out what I'm seeing from here. It just looks like. Just so it looks like okay. there's a, maybe an engine, maybe a truck in the front of the place. Okay. I, you know, I don't know. Again, it's a two dimensional picture. You're coming down the street with you, your crew, and uh, your attack line. All right. So what, what I'm looking at, it what appears to be a two story town. Home. It appears um, to be, yes. The key thing is you said I'm engine number two, so uh, my policy kind of already dictates what I'm going to do or what I'm supposed to do, and that's provide a backup line, provide a backup in general to the uh, first in engine. So unless I've been given a separate direction by that uh, first one scene engine officer, I am going to pull a backup line and link up with them and figure out what needs to be done from there. So you get uh, closer to the house, 25, 30 feet from the house, and into the jet black smoke they go. Mm-hmm. What, what, does that change anything that you do? Uh, any direction that you give? Anything? So you're saying that the first in engine. They're, going, just, they're in. They take, they take their line in. Yes. Oh, so we're going to follow them in, yeah. We're, we're going to follow them in. And then uh, I'm going to try to get in contact inside with that first in engine officer and hopefully get some kind of really quick plan as to what his objectives are, what he's trying to accomplish, or maybe something that he saw that I didn't see, especially if I'm trying to catch up to him. But, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm there to back him up. So if something happens to him and I'm not there to, to help out, then I'm failing not only my crew but his crew as well or her crew as well. Do you uh, have picture three ready to go? They're, they're audible. <laughs> That's the back side. What if we said this was the Charlie side of the place? 
So, uh, all right, so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more fire, uh, given the construction and, 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 and how much fire is involved. Uh, I mean, my objective still, and, and hopefully, you know, I don't know what part of the county I'm in or, or you well, know. Maybe we'll add Lynn that. <laughs> After you tell me something, I'll change that. So, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a large, it appears to be a large volume of fire, and it looks like it's already up in the attic, so it's traveling the first and second floor, so it's up in the void. So uh, this, is, this is pretty significant. So, uh, I mean, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm drawn in with that first in engine officer, so I'm there to back him up. I'm there to help him knock some of the bulk of this fire. But, uh, I mean, there's some... There's some significant concerns. What if with the, this I told picture. you the basement was on fire? So that's a huge concern because now we're above an uncontrolled fire, and so uh, would that, does that change? That changes your everything. Actions? Yeah, we gotta uh, unless there's like a known rescue, we gotta get away from that uncontrolled fire. I mean, our entire IRP, at least the way I interpret it and the way that it's written, is essentially, hey, uh, don't go above a basement fire if you don't have to. Um, I know from. All of the line of duty death reports that I've read, all of the case studies that I've read, how dangerous a basement fire is. So unless there is like a known rescue, um, I'm not, um, we shouldn't be above that uncontrolled fire. So would you still, now this first engine company has gone. Are you still going in to try to get them? Are you going around to the... Charlie side to <laughs> control some of that uncontrolled basement fire. I mean, so and again, it's there's a little bit of double edged sword here, right? Th there is, there is. So uh, two story townhome, uh, you know, not a lot of square footage, at least not what I saw from the picture. So my hope is that I don't have to get too deep into this structure, and I'm able to get their attention and get them out, uh, uh, if nothing else, by. <laughs> you know, pulling on their line, something to get them to acknowledge me, to uh, recognize me, and I can hopefully get them to come towards me. Um, if the absolute worst case scenario where this officer was like, I'm not doing a thing you say, I'm just going to keep on pushing in, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm there to back them up. So um, now my concern is there is a possible rescue, and that rescue could be that crew. Yeah. So I need to start taking action to do whatever I can to assist that crew. So in that particular situation, the only thing that I could think of that would benefit that crew is getting that fire uh, on the lowest floor extinguished. So, um, I mean. So you might reposition to the Charlie side. I probably will have to reposition, yeah. Given the volume of fire that I saw from that picture, yeah. Yeah, I'd probably reposition. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant Shipley, now you did a circle check and saw the Charlie side. Sure, as the second do. As you're going, yeah. Right. So I'm as you're going back up, you see the captain, the 30 year captain. Sure. Captain Miller disappear. What do you say? If I can't uh, make voice contact with you, I'm going to call you on the radio and say, hey, you got a large volume of fire on the rear that is vertically spreading, and uh, we're stretching our line to the Charlie side to knock it down. Right? Uh, I don't want to do opposing hand lines, but I also don't want you uh, to walk in that front door and fall into that basement fire. Lieutenant Purcell, would you? So I will deviate back to Churubusco. This is a similar setup. You have fire on all three floors. You have a crew operating above a basement fire. Given where we are in the county, these could be. So this I'm, is in Rock. I'm going to say this yeah. is in Rockville. So. So Rockville, Rockville, yeah, Rockville, Bethesda, you know, we have different mixed-use townhouses. We have some in 26's area that have two-story townhouses on top with apartments on the bottom. So they could be operating on top of an apartment that has no interior stairwell access to control any of that fire. Um, being if that's what I saw on my circle check and there was a line inside the door, I would try to get those guys to back out because this is – this is clearly going towards an exterior only operation until we knock a bulk of this fire down. You know, um, judging by the looks of all three floors, there's really not much survivability from side Charlie. Um, so, but we can't, we can't, you know, knock out other rooms because your front rooms could have a door shut and it could be clear as day. Yeah. But given the large volume of fire that we have, probably more fire than we have house, you know, 
think it's time to, you know, pull those guys out and try to knock it down from or outside. Or do our best to communicate yeah. that with Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, it, that's tough if you have a guy that's, you know, leading a crew in on the first new engine that's not going to listen to a thing you said, hasn't gone out back and looked to see what's going on. I mean, it's kind of – it's kind of tight. You kind of have to let command know, hey, you know, this is what I saw inside, Charlie. We need to pull people out. I think the and key change thing our there is, is it, it's, they are a rescue. That's yeah. the way we're interpreting this is that first in crew, and I think yeah. all three of us have kind of agreed to that, is it's essentially like they're becoming a rescue because, I mean, from that picture, side alpha, it was pretty turbulent, black smoke yeah. pushing out of the second-story window. Uh, that's just because there were no openings on the first floor and the door hasn't been opened yet. And then the Charlie side looking like that. I mean, we're kind of dictated by policy as far as what we can do, and we get a lot of variance when it comes to life safety. And even a little bit, you know, I think it, the exact wording is limited risk for savable property, but... I mean, from that backside, it's it's if it's not already exterior, it's going that way. So that's like a you're so coming. You would out. almost opt out, opt out of backing them up to position on the Charlie side to to try to knock some of that visible fire. Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't. Uh, yes, but I don't like the wording. So I look at it like I am doing. <laughs> so everything I am doing is in is in. Uh, in assistance to that first in crew, and uh, I'm doing what I'm doing because of that first crew that went in. So I can't get them to back out. So, uh, which in in my opinion, I I would get them out. I, I would. I mean that that particular structure is small enough. I'm gonna I'm gonna catch up to them and and we're gonna get out. But going in with where you're going with this, which I think I I understand where you're trying to uh i'm not trying to trip you. well no 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 but what you're you're where you're trying to go with the the uh the particular incident yes i would at that point i would do everything in my power to uh get rid of the basement fire or at least uh subdue uh that below grade fire to the point where hopefully they they back out or or because I mean, they're they're becoming they're literally going to become a rescue. It's if it hasn't gone south at that point, like if the next part of that story isn't, oh, they're gone and the line's going, you know, straight down. Then it's probably getting very close. At I mean, our like I said, our entire policy is written so that not only do we check for a basement, but or a basement fire, but someone else goes and double checks for a basement yeah. fire, and that's for good reason because of what happens when we get above those uncontrolled fires. So without life safety, which you never mentioned, and I'm assuming that that's not, you know... Uh, well, it is our, that's our primary Right, concern. right, right. Uh, We're putting this fire out for Sure, but not directed, not, you know, uh, right. known information. Uh, so nothing that says, hey, uh, we've got a known rescue or we've got a pretty good idea that there is a rescue, especially in, in something that's... I mean, there's probably very little survivable space left inside of that structure given what that charlie side looks like i'm not saying it's impossible and i certainly wouldn't rule it out but everything i'm doing inside of that structure everything i would hope the first in engine doing is doing inside of that structure is strictly for life safety and that could be why they're pushing in is maybe maybe they've got something that they just haven't relayed over the radio of hey there there's a baby in there there's yep. some whatever. type of but whatever so same scenario, you're on the rescue squad. What What's our plan? Search any of the survivable spaces. I mean, side Charlie, I mean, that's side Charlie. That building is pretty much written off. I mean, there's no survival space. It looks like it's already through the roof. The roof's already collapsed from judging by this picture of what it looks like. Yeah, I, I, I can't tell, but I, yeah, I, can, see I mean, can see that. I mean, at that point, you know, if they're not overrun by fire, they're potentially overrun by smoke. We they're still potentially, you know, a viable patient. Um, but I mean, this is kind of this is kind of a toss up. I mean, you know, do you, you know, risk a lot? You know, and who are you getting this information from that everyone's out or if somebody's trapped? So, I mean, I would, I would lead to say, you know, search what you can and. First do engine. Yeah. Same question, first do engine for front or back. Almost the same scenarios we have. 
uh, our first picture, what would you do? That's again, that's a tough read because it's a two dimensional picture. Certainly. Um, you can't see the conditions of those windows. You can't see the second floor conditions. Is that smoke strictly outside or is it coming out of the second floor? If you've got nothing coming out of the second floor, if you can make the stairs and get up there to search above that, fine, make it quick, get out. Um, I mean, that's really what I would do. What about engine company operations? I mean, from the get go, honestly, I would have stretched to the rear and knocked the bulk of that down. Almost highlighting the importance of our 360, yeah. right? You know, and all of these are, are, are really that way and, and something that I think we're trying to do and we, we should be doing a better job of it and communicating a better job of it. But, lap. Yeah. So, I mean, with the, back to the communications thing, I mean, this is the end of the road townhouse. You're not jogging six ways or another. You know, this is quick right out your door down the side of this townhouse. By the time that guy gets that hose load on his shoulder, you can say, hey, round back. Yeah. Set it through the front door. Certainly. And just reposition your line. Yep. Plus, there's a, and I don't, <laughs> I don't mean to continue to beat this, but no, you're not. There's, there's also the possibility, and this goes back to survival space, that when we get up there and we get up to that door, maybe we take a quick peek in and we see that that first floor is, is it, it, even with that picture looking the way that it does, it's not out of the realm of possibility that that first floor could, you know, Still. look relatively clear. Yeah. Um, is smoke which, on the floor or is smoke at your waist? Right. Where is which, smoke? you know, that would also play. So it's not just the outside picture, it's the inside picture as well. And I think in, with these, you know, these townhomes in particular, I mean, that's, that's really the, the ultimate I guess equalizer is is not only what do we see on the outside, but what do we see on the inside as yep. well? Because anything we do inside of this house, I mean, we can do quickly. I can get from the alpha side of the Charlie side of that structure in, you know, even even in a smoke filled environment, relatively quickly, um, for the most part. So it, it's when it gets a lot larger that it becomes that much more challenging. And I think that the decisions need to—I don't want to say slow down, but it. it becomes less about that split second decision, a little bit more of, okay, do I really want to commit to this? Um, but again, that's kind of going off the path uh, a little too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, while you're on the path, uh, we're going to move to uh, num uh, number, yes, Chief. Hot in off the press. All right. So a viewer was on that call. I would like to add a few comments. All right. So to call, uh, what you see is the engine and truck. First do engine and truck at the front door. It's 0500 hours in the morning. If you guys don't go mind, if you don't mind going back to the, the front picture, side alpha. Right? Uh, occupants were standing outside on this fire and uninjured. 360 was completed, and they still went through the front door. Uh, and this, so this is, this might be 10 years ago now, right? So this, this really was before we were big meeting as a department on hitting it from the outside, right? So I think, think those of us have been around long enough, right? The way to attack a basement fire was down the basement stairs. It didn't matter how bad that thing was cracking, cranking, right? Fire out back, it didn't matter. You went inside. And then we changed some of that, I'm going to say, so this is my comment now, right? We changed some of that was, uh, if you think about when Chief Bowers and we did the whole risk assessment and you had the uh, fire in uh, Prince William that the fellow line of duty death and then you had the fire in Loudoun, Loudoun County, Middlewood Drive, right? All of those talked about the fire on the outside of the box. And after that, we changed some of this, so... Back to the uh, person that was there, and this was a unit officer, right? So this was a company officer. They talk about the other thing that made it better was that a later arriving engine, hmm, like not the first, uh, swept the rear and took care of things. So, right. And really, we need to be geared towards our mindset of if you see something on fire, regardless of your position, put water on it. Sure. It's only going to make things better, right? And, and again, I'm just going by a picture, but I think that that's something that, um, you know, I should have mentioned. But that is where the interoperability between your first and your second engine, the communication is huge because you're not going to knock all of that with what, you know, it's going to 
it's going to be more than one line. Certainly. Just because of the spaces you're going to get confined to. So uh, Certainly. Yeah, it's just, you know. But coordinating know. with the unit, even if you're operating on the first floor of that picture and having a unit go around to the back, you both can operate at the same time. Absolutely. You're not going to push fire on Absolutely. each other. Absolutely. So uh, is that it there, Chief Davis, for questions? Did it? Uh, hang on. Let me check. Sorry. Yes. Okay. So we're going to go to um, picture 11. Prior to putting this up, uh, Lieutenant Braun, you're up. All right. So this is a uh, single engine service call to assist a homeowner. All right. When we get there, this is what we see. Looks like a, uh, I don't know, a horse has fallen into some kind of hole. Right? Yep. So All what right. are your considerations? Here? So uh, obviously this call is, is going to be technical in nature. Um, now, given the policy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to refer back to the mnemonic in that policy acre. Uh, it's something I heard even before I came here. Uh, so assess, control, rescue, and evacuate. So I don't want to sound indifferent or uh, to the horse or to animals in general, but my biggest concern with this particular picture is not necessarily the horse, it's that person that's right next to the horse. I don't know what it is that caused that horse to fall into the hole, um, but it's falling into the hole. Horse has got small brains, that's what Right, and, 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 and I mean... I'm not, I I, I, so, <laughs> you know, I, I, I grew up in Baltimore. I, I don't know a thing about horses. Hopefully crew resource management. I got someone on my crew can, you know, tell me a thing or two about horses. But before I even get to that, my biggest concern is that person next to the horse. Um, What's your concern so with that person? That he could fall in and then he himself could become a victim as well. So, okay, so he's uh, the horse, oh, horse owner. Okay, we'll and, say, and, and I'm sure he's going to be uh, upset and not uh, not exactly thrilled that I'm going to try to convince him to get away from the horse, uh, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? So my concerns with this is that, again, I don't know what caused that horse to fall in, so uh, I need to get that person away from there, and I need to get this area isolated. Um, so, for the time being. I'm going to focus on getting this person out of here. Um, so hopefully he'll come with me and I'm able to convince him that, um, you know, the horse, whether he's standing right next to the horse or not, we're going to do what we can and we're going to hopefully build this call out and work our way towards getting this horse out of there. But How are you going to build the call out? What are you going to do? So I'm going to call for additional resources. Who's this, that? This is a, a technical rescue call. Um, so I don't know exactly what it was, again, that the horse fell into. So and I'm not going to guess, uh, but I'm going to call people who can hopefully, who can tell me that. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so uh, isolation, getting him away from there. Um, hopefully after speaking with him, I can get some type of inclination of, of what it is that that horse fell into and how big it is. But uh, whatever I think it is, I'm going to take that and I'm going to double it. Uh, and then I'm going to let Montgomery know that uh, I'm going to need a, uh, a TRT response to my location. Okay. And uh, Lieutenant Purcell, would you do anything different? No. I mean, or additional considerations? So, uh, on top of additional considerations, so he said, you know, TRT rescue. Um, I know our capabilities. This isn't something we can handle outside of TRT assets, you know, to trying to make things a little bit easier we could ask him you know if he has a vet that comes that could come to you know either uh care sedate. what's that care sedate yeah so sedate that horse that would affect make this rescue a little bit easier on our guys and allow them to work around this this horse without injuring any additional people um and that's all stuff that you would have to go through with that with the owner of that horse um, other than that, I agree with everything Lieutenant Braun said so far. So, Lieutenant Shipley, anything? Uh, so I'm going to tell you I would take a different approach, but I, I want to hear. No, I mean, so I've been involved in one horse rescue. wasn't in a culvert. wasn't down a hole. It was in a, a pond that was cold out. 
basically did the same thing, right? Isolate deny entry. Um, you know, we got vet a vet that was, um, or the horse's vet was called there, and we used outside uh, assistance to mitigate the rescue. You know, but building the call out, um, getting the appropriate resources, the appropriate know-how, the appropriate equipment, and um, ensuring that we're safe, the owner's safe, and then the horse is safe. Yeah. So I think I'm going to use this gentleman. He, I don't know anything. I'm like you. I don't know anything about horses either. <laughs> um, if this is a horse owner, he probably does, right? So he's, he's help me help you type of, that's the approach that I would take with this gentleman. You know, I think the vet is an excellent thing. He's probably has that kind of information available. And then we know it would be a, a, a TRT response of some sort. So probably a can I consult. throw it back though? Hmm? You said you wanted to use this gentleman. I probably would. He's already there. So what would he's, you do if he was the caller because he's already exhausted all of his resources and he called us? Oh, we're still going to control the event. Yeah. I'm just going to help him. I'm going to use him to help me understand that animal. Okay. What it might do, what he knows about it, what he knows about how it got to where it is. And that's probably vet. better. Um, yeah, I mean, and I don't mean that. So I'm thinking in my head, like if I'm this, he's probably not going to want to leave that horse. So it's going to be probably a challenge not. getting him away. Right? Probably not. Um, but given, you know, our, our life safety always goes back to life safety. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that I, I I like that if he's you know if he's working with us and and less less likely that he'll put up a fight for anything that I have yep. to ask him to do. So I'm, it's I'm, it's I'm almost like it. a homeowner to me. Is this your house? Yes, it is. What's on fire, and how do I get there? They're going to give right. me the, the best answers instead of me trying to sort all that stuff out. Um, I do like the uh, isolate the area. I, I, I like that. Um, the vet thing, I think, was good. So, all right, we're kind of running out of time, so we are going to go to a video. Um, Lieutenant Shipley, you want to do the next one? This will be the last one, actually. So we'll go to the video. And let's just follow the script that they had with the COLA program. So stop it at whatever point. All right, so we've stopped this. So this is actually a scenario that they're using in our current COLA class, or the COLA class that's happening right now. Uh, incident objectives, Lieutenant Shipley. Uh, continue the survivability of the occupants who are trapped inside, if they're in there. Okay, so what do you believe that is to be right now? Middle of the day. Yeah. Doors closed. I don't have anyone standing outside, so good probability that there's a possibility someone's in there okay so we're going to go in we're going to yeah. search for somebody right yep. put a hand line in place uh so going back to the you know the irp staple principles right <clears throat> uh continue survivability of the occupants inside and then once you locate them pull them out give them an ems care uh prevent the fire from extending past its current uh compartment or uh compartment of origin or compartment that it's in uh, smoke control, which in this one looks like it's going to be pretty um, crucial, flow path-wise, and then um, conserve as much property as possible. Okay. And we're going to conserve property by what? Going through the front door? You're going to go through the window? What What are you going to do? I know there's a lot of variables that associated yeah, with Yeah, I mean, I don't have any smoke that's coming from the front, so, you know, very well could possibly be compartmentalized. Um, I did have the smoke from that front alpha quadrant uh, window. It has since stopped, um, which is concerning. Um, I know that as soon as I open up that door, I'm going to be introducing air into that structure, and it's going to change the flow path and change the dynamics of where, where it's getting its air from and being fed from. Um, but as long as I have a charged hose line there, um, I, don't, I don't have any... Right now, we yeah. think it's a room. 
Yeah. In a house. Yep. It's vented. Front door. Sur- there the front is. Door. People are. There's survivable space. Absolutely. We're going to put the fire out. Yep. Okay. All right. Let's play. Based on that vantage point, uh, I have more than a room because it's, you know, left or right, um, Bravo to Delta side of the house, uh, fire involvement, um, you know, that could... Hold on one sec. Okay. Keep, keep your thought, but we're going to stop it in just a second. All right, so continue with what you were saying. So uh, just looking at the structure itself, it's an older house. I'm not dealing with lightweight wood frame. Uh, I'm dealing with, you know, metal metal siding, um, true, true lumber, um, smoke conditions. It doesn't look like I have any, you know, super turbulent black angry smoke. Um, based on, you know, what I'm seeing, front door would still be the best option. Uh, hallways run, you know, the longest length, so they're more than likely going to be a hallway in there. Um, I have more than more than one compartment off, two compartments, maybe two rooms in a hallway, um, but I still do have windows that are intact. Uh, don't want to be breaking those um, and start the attack from that front door based on what I've seen so far. Do you believe the fire to be in the attic space? There's a good potential, right? Um, how long has it been burning? Uh, I see that it is, you know, coming out the window there, uh, and and it is exposing that overhang. Um, I don't have fire f- through the roof. I don't have, um, you know, angrier smoke, if you will. Um, if it is up there, you know, I do have some grayish, brownish, where the um, uh, members in the roof structure could start to uh, begin to uh, go through paralysis. But um, yes, front door, front door. Still. Still. Lieutenant Purcell, what about, do you, do you believe the same as Lieutenant? Yeah, Lieutenant? front door. We're still headed through the front door? Yep, uh, front door. And judging by that video, when he was going from Alpha to Delta, it's definitely up in the attic. You know, the way it's, the way it's coming out of those eaves. So... I mean, it's definitely, like he said, it's an older home, so we have a little bit more time to work. Um, and that's, I agree with pretty much everything you said. All right, so let's let the uh, video play for a couple more minutes. Or is it up in the attic and that's, that's, that uh, flue is already broken for us or something like that? Uh, All right, let's stop it there. All right, so is that dropped down? So, huh. with our decision yep. earlier about going through the front door, right, so now we are here, I don't know, two minutes later. 40 seconds later, different conditions. Is our plan still the same? Lieutenant Shipley, is your plan still the same? They, the fire that I have there on the, uh, the Bravo side, I'm, I would like to, can you go back like two seconds? Yeah. There's a 
a little bit of a glare, I'm sorry. So I can't tell if that's a casement window for a basement or... So that... <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So that's what I thought with the chimney. That's what I thought. When I, I well, couldn't remember if the chimney... And the black smoke the from time. the chimney, right? Yeah. All right, so we're going to pause for a, sec a couple seconds. Yeah. We have three questions we're going to take, and then we're going to let this play. And just so we can watch a little bit of fire yeah. development. Just that's what it is. There's a basement. And that is now four questions. Okay. Uh, answer however you want if you want to discuss it, uh, whatever, right? So, uh, and I don't know what order. I'll give this order first. Uh, they're coming in multiple media, so I got to work a bunch of devices. The basement One, uh, why not break the front windows, but it's okay to open the front door? So I guess there was some discussion about it. I'm not going to take the windows, but it was okay to front door and a follow up to that. Why, why do you perceive the windows as off limits? Oh, yeah. So I said I'll it. So with that I'll, I'll, I'll answer that one, right? Go. So if I take out the big bay window in the front, I can't control that anymore. Uh, even if I stretch the line through the door, I can still somewhat close it to try and con control that airflow, um, the fresh air going in uh, to fuel that fire. But if I take the window, all bets are off. So th that was my my, my logic behind that decision-making process. Yeah, we're creating the opening without putting a line on the fire. That's no good. Yeah. Yeah. All right, question. Uh, any concern about the wind? You can hear it in the video, so we yes. we can't hear that. So we, ha we have no audio, so. Yep. But we can see it. We can, yeah, I mean, we wind, can see it a little bit. Yeah, it's Wind's perfect. always an issue, you know. Um, being, be, being cognizant of that whenever you are performing operations, especially, you know, ventilating. So uh, Chief Bailey uh, makes a couple comments. And of course, uh, this was one of his videos uh, that they use in the online COLA stuff. So he has two comments. One, uh, violent, and I'm just going to read them uh, verbatim, violent distribution of water onto burning surfaces. The window that was Then open. perhaps considered a point of entry. And then uh, follow up after you folks talk some. Uh, he also notes that also the assumption of dimensional lumber denies the possibility of renovations. Uh, it is a logical assumption, but not foolproof. And take it away, the energy from the outside makes it a safer operation. So I, I do think in our older housing stock, we see that, right, renovation. And actually, uh, as I just think about it, uh, where was the double mayday? Not Lanark. Uh, Lorraine. Lorraine. Lorraine Avenue, right? That was renovation stuff, yes, right? So anyway. I believe so. So here's two comments. Violent distribution of water before you go, and then uh, the whole notion about, uh, you know, assumption of dimensional whatever. So I think to note also is we were watching this video and trying to make decisions prior to fire department arrival. Sure. Right. Where conditions are completely right. different yep. after fire department arrival. So let's let this go just a couple of more minutes. So the fire department is now just stretching an attack line. Conditions are different than when we first got there in our fire SUV. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Um, so our tactic may indeed that change. Flash. That's flashing. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. if I'm pulling up to this, decision-making is going to be completely different. So your decision-making at this point would be? I'm taking the line to the Bravo side. And putting the fire that you Absolutely. see out. Yeah. Okay. And I would I would wholeheartedly agree. The likelihood of anything surviving beyond that point is, is your life safety is pretty much ruled out there. I mean, it's, it's it flashed. So. Yeah. So there, and there it goes. Right yep. there. Comment from Chief Bailey, hot in off the press, says, okay. we've already discussed it, right? if you cool the fire first, the window versus the door matters less. Essentially alluding to, if you see something on fire, put it in. Okay, we can, yes. So we can see how quickly environmental factors sure. change the course of a fire. This fire was well advanced prior to fire department arrival, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, 
I would like to thank the three of you for coming out tonight, putting yourselves out there a little bit, um, explaining some of your thought process behind running calls. Uh, it is important to do. It's important to continue to talk about this stuff at the lineup table, whenever. Um, and then to continue to communicate the way we're going to, to do things, the way we're going to run our fire trucks. Um, next, uh, on the 19th, uh, our next challenge in the street will be on the 19th. Uh, here from the training school, 1900 hours, it will be Chief Dempsey uh, speaking about automatic sprinkler systems. So until then, uh, thank you very much. Have a good evening.